Hi there, this is Sifu Slim, and I am in Santa Barbara, California, and I'm really excited today to be talking about wellness, physical activity, and I was even going to bring in something that we all know that all of us, not just young people, but even people in their 80s are doing a lot of, which is screen time, and I'm going to ask someone who coaches these types of people how we can get more in touch with uh, connecting our body to our mind, to our spirit, learning about what we put in our bodies, what we do with our bodies, proper rest, and all these wonderful things. And I think this is so important to talk about it. And wellness has been on everyone's mind. If you grew up back in the day, like our grandparents and great grandparents, they always had little potions uh, in their medicine cabinets that were natural. They had certain soups that they would eat during cold season. They, uh, they knew what to do to get rid of headaches in a natural way. They had all these things and hallelujah that they had them, but many of these things were lost starting in the middle of the 20th century. So maybe I'll start off with uh, Magdalene Shish and ask her if she remembers anything that she learned from her grandmother. And then we'll do your bio after that. But I just wanted to jump on anything you learned from your ancestor, or your mom about wellness. Sure. Actually, that, that's such a good point that you brought up that our ancestors and not that long ago, like our grandparents even had all these natural remedies. So it's not just from like traditional Chinese medicine that goes thousands of years back, but even up until our grandparents, they had a ton of natural remedies. So for me, well, one thing I remember, and I actually still do it now. So speaking of cold and flu season, if you get, if you start coming down with something, one thing my grandma would do it, and I altered this a little bit myself, but the basic thing is a whole lemon. So I, I call it hot Polish lemonade. So it's hot water with an entire lemon in there, the juice of a lemon, ginger cut up, garlic cut up. Uh, I add some cayenne pepper for the kick and for the circulation and then some honey. And we would drink that and it honestly would make the cold or flu either go away or shorten the duration of it significantly. Another thing I remember is putting onions on the bottoms of your feet when you have a cold and oh. onions draw out toxins. Yeah, so onions and then socks on top, of course. And then in the morning you wake up feeling much better. So those are, those are two remedies I remember. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Merci beaucoup. So we've uh, determined that because Magdalena is such a polyglot and speaks so many languages that we're going to try at some point in the future in French, un peu en français, un peu en espagnol. And if I can learn Polish, un peu en polonais, a little bit in Polish at some point in the future. Any languages I missed? I missed? I speak a tiny, tiny bit of Portuguese, and then I understand a little bit of German, but I would ah. not say I speak it at all. <laughs> I'm working on German, and I've been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for ah. over 20 years. Ordem e progresso. Oh, que, que bem, que bom. <laughs> Obrigada. Obrigado. So yeah. Magdalena, Magdalena is up in Calgary in Canada and uh, part of her wellness bio in terms of being an, uh, a, a person who teaches and coaches and hosts shows on wellness is that she's a certified health and wellness coach and she's passionate about helping people implement healthy habits effortlessly. Boy, effortlessly, that's not even an easy word for me sometimes. It's not an effortless word. <laughs> <laughs> her areas of expertise include weight loss, which I don't need help with currently, Adrenal fatigue, I've been there before, anxiety, depression, and stress management. She runs an online organization called Love Your Body, a show which helps people lose weight without focusing on the weight. Boy, that's great. And she also runs fun and interactive stress management programs for corporations and organizations. Um, and then in addition to that, Magdalena loves to self-express her, herself through free flow dance. I love free flow dance. If we had more camera and more ability, I would do some with you right now. But tell me if I missed anything that you want to share with the, the viewers about your background and health. No, you got it all down. That's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. Adrenal fatigue. Um, now, is there anything we can do with onions for adrenal fatigue? No. <laughs> <laughs> I remember um, learning about things in the refrigerator and somebody told me um, many years ago that if you put the 
uh, onion in there, be careful because the onion is absorbing all of the bacteria and, and other uh, things that, that come about inside of a moist, cold place in the refrigerator, which you're opening all the time and closing it and moisture builds up and other food uh, has other particles on it. So the onion is the one that's at this absorbing all those things. And then we have the bicarbonate of soda, the sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, et cetera, that we yeah. can put in there. Anything along those lines that we should know about our refrigerator? Uh, that's really interesting that you say that. So yeah, the potency of onions. Uh, about our fridge, I don't know, keep it clean, sanitized. Um, I, I just have baking soda in there open. But I wanted to tell you a little story about onions. Well, I think this is the theme of, uh, <laughs> of the show today, but do you want to hear a crazy story about onions? Sifu would love to hear it. Okay, so I'm re I was reading this book. It's called Ancient Secrets of a Master Healer. And this was an ancient Ayurvedic doctor that was treating patients, literally like miracle stories, just with natural remedies, things you can find in, if, if you're Indian, in your cupboard. So different spices, mix them together, different marma points, which are basically like acupressure points on the body, like different things that you just stimulate by pressing on them. So there's this one doctor, he had actually passed away this past February, Dr. Naram, he was only in his 50s but he was treating people by the hundreds. People were flocking to him because he was like a miracle healer, but it wasn't miraculous. It was just the power of these herbs and his knowledge about Ayurvedic medicine. So there was a situation where a lady came to him because her daughter was in a coma and she was basically dying. And the doctors at the hospital, she was you know, in the ICU unit, obviously hooked up to machines. And they were telling this lady to make a decision about her daughter, whether to take her off life support or what's happening because they couldn't keep her for much longer. And so the lady in desperation went to see Dr. Naram, who was actually super busy that day, but he, he sent one of his people over to the hospital. So this lady, so imagine this girl like in a coma for quite a while, completely unconscious about to die. So one of the things he did was put some, an onion on one side of her head and because it draws out toxins and then milk <laughs> a little bit of milk in a glass bowl on the other side of her head and the reason for that is so the tox toxins get drawn out of just one in in one direction and the milk would would block it so it just causes it to come out uh then he did he created this remedy out of like ghee which is clarified butter and then he mixed a bunch of spices in there specific to this girl and he put it in her belly button because through your belly button, you can actually absorb uh, nutrients, especially if you can't eat. And she was already hooked up on IVs. So she put a, he put in her belly button and then he had the mother do a bunch of different marma points that were going into this girl's subconscious mind. And she was also supposed to speak certain affirmations out loud. So just basically telling her daughter that she loves her, that she would like her to stay if she wants to stay on earth. And she had to do this a few times a day which was basically, again, like stimulating just at certain points. And I think it was within two days that the girl had opened her eyes. And within a week, she was out of the ICU and she was fine, like talking, walking, just basically alive again. And not only that, but there were four other patients in that ICU unit and all of them actually had recovered because Dr. Naram ended up treating all of them because when, when the family saw that this one patient was out, they were like, what did you do? Can you do this to our family members? And he had gotten them out of the ICU through these simple, simple techniques. I mean, it's, it's, it's not simple because it's intricate and he had to do these things very specific to her body, but they were all natural and like involved in onion. That's, that's fascinating. Um, the un unraveling the onion is leading to all kinds of things. I'm, I'm sure there are books written on the healing power of onions. I've, in one of my other videos, it's called Honey, I Love You. And it's about the experience of ra uh, raising bees and um, uh, extracting uh, the honey from the honeycombs and then and using it for enjoyment and for medicinal reasons. And the book that I cite um, is called Honey, I Love You. And it talks about all the benefits of honey. It's just an amazing thing. So I'm sure if we looked into onions and we looked into many other things, there, there are volumes of information that we could find about them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I bet. Now I want to research it. <laughs> it's not something I think about often, but yes. So uh, Magdalena, can you tell us your website and the be best way people can uh, use your website as a resource, your videos as a resource and connect with you uh, through the website for appointments, et cetera? Yeah, sure. So my email is info at magdalenawellness.com. Magdalena is M-A-G-D-A-L-E-N-A. And then my website is uh, magdalenawellness.com. And then I'm also, I post a lot of things on Instagram. And my Instagram name is mambo underscore mags. <laughs> M-E-G-S? M-A-M-B-O underscore M-A-G-S. M-A-G-S, yeah. mags, okay. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking and I mentioned in the beginning about uh, our ancestors and if we go back the, further than that they start to call people the ancients I think that's a nice word the ancients oh, cool. thought this way and I the word that came uh, several years ago that someone reminded me of is the word arrogance and knowledge there's an arrogance to controlling the flow of, 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 of language and knowledge and also pushing away ancient knowledge, which, which worked for thousands, tens of thousands, or even longer years in the past. So I think it's arrogant to think that the ancients didn't know as much as the modernites in many areas of lifestyle. Maybe you can comment if, if you find the same thing about modern uh, oh. people uh, expressing doubts about past uh, learning. Could I ever comment? I could go on and on about this. Um, like I said, I'm fascinated with traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, both of which go at least 5,000 years back. Um, but basically, modern medicine is extremely new. It's what, a few a hundred some years old? <laughs> like, it's very, very fresh and young. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion, but I feel like the Western, so allopathic medicine, which is basically the Western medicine model, is great for acute conditions. So if you need a knee surgery, if you had a heart attack, um, if you're dying of an infection that needs a very strong antibiotic to treat it, it's wonderful for those things. I think in that case, Western medicine can really, really save lives. But I don't think it was necessarily meant to treat chronic conditions. And a lot of the things that people deal with right now in terms of disease are chronic conditions. Also, in large part due to the type of lifestyles we lead and because of the advancement of technology, we are now suffering as a result of it too. Um, but I, with my, honestly, all the conditions that I've had, and I've had quite a few, which is what got me into health coaching, it was all treated at the root cause by natural medicine. And unfortunately, Western medicine did not help. And the reason I started looking into natural medicine is because I was basically had lost hope when I was seeing doctors in the allopathic system. And, and I'm not saying there aren't wonderful doctors. There are great doctors that help people with a lot of conditions. But in my experience, the natural remedies got at the root cause of what I was dealing with. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, I did go to see at a wellness retreat, uh, the main speaker was a doctor, and he started out at UCLA back in the 1960s, and he said he did 15 years of, of allopathic medicine treatment, and to him and his patients, it wasn't working. So at that point, he started learning more, and that field became integrative medicine. I don't know when the first degree of integrative medicine was handed out, but he was one of, I believe, the early ones in, in the United States to get that. Mm -hmm. And there, now it's, it's become more and more popular. So every town in America, it seems, uh, if, as long as it, it gets to a certain size, it will start having not just um, a Chinese medicine doctor, and uh, the allopathic both they'll have someone who might be in between he's got the, the he or she has the medical degree and is now bridging that gap yeah. calling themselves integrative medicine specialists mm -hmm. uh they may even have a naturopathic uh doctor degree and an md and then they're also referring out so they they understand that hey this person needs yoga therapy uh it needs herbal treatments it, it needs other types of things and they'll refer those yeah. people out whereas the allopathic historically and this is sad 
uh, for, since I've been adult has been, in my opinion, very hesitant to refer out to uh, what's called non-traditional, even though it's the older version, not, they call it non-traditional medicine. Funny. So maybe you can comment on that turf war and where, where in your experience it's been going over the last 10 to 15 years and, and what do you see happening after uh, you know, this point, 2021 going forward? Oh, I totally agree with you. And uh, yeah, I think, first of all, integrative medicine is probably the most holistic form of medicine. So to have a doctor that knows about drugs, about medications that can treat certain things and also can work in combination with naturopaths and Chinese doctors, um, sorry, Chinese medicine doctors is amazing. And I do, I do see healthcare going in that direction. That's what it seems like. And I'm even seeing more doctors being educated on nutrition, even the doctor that I saw recently, just because I wanted, I, I often go to doctors just to get diagnosed and then I kind of treat myself, but he knows so much about natural wellness that I almost feel like he's a naturopath, but he's not, he just does his own research. Um, he was, you know, he educated in, in regular Western medicine, but it's really cool. And I was like, wow, it's really nice to see a doctor who knows both sides of it. So I definitely do see more and more doctors going in that direction. And I feel like people are kind of waking up that their bodies um, are very like mind, body, soul, it's, it's all connected. And we can't just isolate it to, okay, you have this symptom, take this drug. People are seeing that drugs are having side effects and they're not working as well. And they're turning towards more natural things. So yeah, it's definitely going in that direction of integrative medicine. Um, yeah, which is great. So uh, a naturopath, uh, the schools, I believe, are improving over the last 20 years in, in my country. And I'm, I would guess, you know, Germany being a leader of thought, of engineering, of medicine, historically, I think they've been going mm -hmm. strong for far longer, uh, naturopathic doctors. And I'm so glad that this is happening. Um, I think it's not a bad place to start if you don't have a a pain that's unbearable. Mm -hmm. If you're, um, if you don't have, you know, really bad, uh, like phlegm or something that might be a lung condition, something really bad, I would, you know, seek whatever help you feel comfortable and also take advice from your close confidants, your family and get in there and, and go, you know, get to the root of it and see, see what's going on. But if you do have something like, like you mentioned, a chronic thing or something that's coming on slowly, I, why not start with the naturopath? My, my chiropractor here in Santa Barbara, who has practiced for almost 40 years, he said he's become the uh, generalist, the primary care person for mm -hmm. his, uh, many of his patients. And because he's known them for so long, he can send them out to uh, an MD. He can send them out to, uh, you know, another practitioner, uh, a, a, a massage, if they need a massage, you know, what have you. And that's what he's been doing. And, and he's very intelligent. Uh, I, you know, I would put him up uh, against many of the people I've met. And I've met, you know, hundreds in my, in my life and then in, in my uh, investigation in the health and wellness. He is a leader uh, in terms of patient care, and staying up on things. I mean, the, the amount he reads is pretty impressive. So um, maybe share what, what you think about having people, a trusted practitioner, confidant uh, that knows medicine as a resource and where, where should somebody start? Well, I was gonna say, you forgot to say health coach. <laughs> Let's let's do it. Bring it. Bring in. Bring in. What prompted you to go into being a health coach and, and how you handle uh, people that that have some sort of ailments? Sure. Yeah. And so with health coaching, I mean, different health coaches spe specialize in different areas. And I I'm very scientific and I love biology. So I do. Some people think I'm a naturopath. I, I, I'm not. And I don't know what a naturopath does, but I kind of lean towards that direction. Like I'm really fascinated with nutrition and gut health and like how different supplements affect your body. So it's not just like an overall lifestyle guidance that I give people. I really go kind of deeper with supplements and such kind of like a naturopath would, which is why, yes, a naturopath is a great place to start as well. I guess the health coaching would just be a little bit more holistic in the sense of we look at like your spiritual practices, your relationships, your career, and also nutrition and and what you keep in your fridge and your pantry. But um, 
to answer your question, what got me into it? Oh, it's a, it's a long story that I'll try to make short, but basically I suffered from quite a few different, like very long-term chronic conditions. So what started it is I actually had parasites for 15 years without knowing it. I just was going to doctors constantly saying something was wrong and I kept being told it's all in my head or that I, basically it's, it's all in my head was a, the answer I kept getting until finally one doctor decided to test me for parasites and it turned out I had an amoeba that was microscopic that had literally spread to my entire body at that point. I had so many symptoms like literally I, I could sleep for 16 hours a day and wake up exhausted and dizzy and anyway. So, but the thing is, so after I was diagnosed with this, she gave me a drug, it didn't do anything. And then it took me three years to actually find a solution for it. And I was referred to the tropical disease specialist in Alberta for parasites. And when I went to see her, she told me there is no cure. They're too small, like they've spread too much and there's nothing she can do. And I'll have to do is organize my life in such a way that I can sleep a lot and not be stressed. <laughs> And I was like, this sounds like hell. Like I was already living in hell for 15 years. My body was just giving up on me. And um, so I was like, okay, bye. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. And then that's when I started research. I joined like these online support groups and I just started researching more about like homeopathy and cleanses and naturopaths. But I'll have to tell you those things didn't work for me because I'm not very good with following rules. And I'm not really good with eliminating um, certain, like eliminating things from my diet. However, I am good at implementing new things. So my mom suggested I went to, I go see an acupuncturist, which I was like, that's not going to help me. How is that going to cure me of parasites? All I was thinking is I need to take something that's going to kill the parasites. But none of these things were working, especially because I wasn't, the drugs didn't work. And then the cleanses didn't work because it was really hard for me to stick to them and like cut everything out. Plus I was craving the bad stuff. The parasites in me were having me crave the sugar and like the junk food basically. So anyway, so I went to the, the acupuncturist and he told me I have two options. Either I can drink bleach because that's how hard they were to treat or I can strengthen my liver. And the liver is responsible for detoxing our body of all pathogens, parasites, bacteria, viruses, everything. So when you have a strong liver, you can actually get rid of anything on your own. And what he did was for two months, I would go see him twice a week for, for needling like needles. And then he gave me this special liver paste. And basically it's just a paste that he makes himself to strengthen the liver. And within two months I was completely cured. Like literally all of my symptoms had gone away. And I was just like, I, I felt like a different person and I couldn't believe it because I was told there's nothing that can be done. And in two months, my body had completely changed because he strengthened my liver. So then I just got really curious and I started researching more. Um, uh, just like, okay, what else can natural medicine do? And I was especially fascinated with Chinese medicine. Uh, but then I got also introduced to essential oils. And a friend of mine who actually lives in Santa Barbara introduced me to them when we were living together in Calgary. And I was seeing the benefits of them just as strongly as I was with Chinese medicine with the herbs and the acupuncture. So then I got involved with doTERRA, which is an essential oil network marketing company. And like one thing led to another and I was thinking like, wow, I'm helping people so much with these essential oils, but I'm sure I can help people in other ways, not just oils. Oil seems like one great way to help, but what about food? What about exercise? And then I did my health coaching certificate in through the Institute of Integrative Nutrition in New York. It's an online program. And then ever since then, so that was like six or seven years ago. Ever since then, I've just been fascinated with natural medicine. Wow, that's that's a really uh, heart rendering uh, story. Uh, boy, I'm so glad that you're able to find the right resource uh, to give you the advice that you need, the diagnosis and the prescription to take care of that. that I think the weakness in the liver permeates our society. Um, the candida overgrowth apparently affects more than 65% of people now, and that's the systemic candida. Uh, you mentioned stress before, so stress is definitely a, 
a, a, a hindrance to uh, ridding our body of a, an overgrowth of candida, high sugar diets, eating yeah. too frequently, um, being overweight. Uh, that's, it's almost guaranteed if you're, you know, significantly, significant, significantly overweight, like 15 to 30% over a, a weight that would be good for you, that you, that you have a candida overgrowth. I would guess it's probably 80 or more percent of those people have a candida overgrowth. Yeah. It's very, very common. Yeah. So, well, and I just wanted to say like, that's the thing, because I kept being told that I have to live in this state of literally, like it felt like hell. And, and I realized I don't have to. And there's so many people that are suffering from things and they they just think there is no solution or they might think there is one, but they can't find it. Like I said, it took me three years to find something that worked. So I just feel like I want to share what I know, because what if what I went through can help somebody else? And, and it has, <laughs> so yeah. If people come out who uh, don't have an M degree, MD degree, and they criticize the way Western medicine works or a particular doctor who has treated them or a, a, pay, a contact of theirs, you, you get accused of being an uneducated person who's doing doctor bashing. Now, the system of medicine where the pharmaceutical companies run to a large degree what is taught in the medical schools. There's, there's this vicious cycle that goes on there. And then the big ag businesses, the big pharmacy biz businesses, big oil is, is you know, our, our, uh, our, yeah. our, our, our yeah, on all of our fields are full of uh, fertilizers made by big oil in most of our fields. So, and, and then if you go to organic manure, you know, where are those cows coming from? The manure doesn't come from the organic farm. It takes a lot of cows to make the manure to, to, to take care of these organic farms. And most of the organic farms don't have cows on them. So those cows, how do they know what the cows are eating and, and what they're living? And so it's a, it's a really crazy world we live in where now we've, we've got this uh, cancel movement where if you come out again against anybody, you say something that's against a certain trend, you're, you're considered someone who needs to be canceled. So um, I'm wondering what to do if you wanna criticize someone and you have information. So I'm gonna give you one bit of information that I find frequently. First of all, the MDs, I've been involved in the, the wellness community in Santa Barbara uh, since about 2008. And when I go to the uh, small, or medium-sized speakers events where there is someone coming in to speak about, like I saw a woman at the college here, UCSB, the university, she spoke on malaria. She has a background in history, I believe, and she studied the history of malaria. That would be a good thing to know. And I go to those things all the time. I go to play, you know, like a health coach speaking. I go to a chiropractor speaking, an MD in integrative medicine. And the amount of times that I, I've seen an MD there in attendance, learning something, interacting with us, having conversations, handing out cards is very small. Very rarely do I see MDs at, at these things. Rarely do I see a pharmacist at these things. It's the, you know, the standard people of care for the normal person in Canada and America are not at these events, uh, having their minds opened and being able to disagree, but they're not out there putting themselves in those events. So uh, I'll start with that. And then I wanna say one more thing and then I'll let, let you chime in. So when you had a problem and the doctor told you there was no cure about it, you went to another doctor, they told you there's nothing you can do. Then you find someone who helps you with the treatment and it works. You can go back to those original people and say, this is what happened. You could even show them the lab reports and what have you. How often do you think those people are gonna change their minds and work that into their new knowledge base and philosophy and admit that they were wrong? Um, probably not that often, but it also very much depends on the person. Some people are much more open-minded. However, it seems to me like that model of teaching is a little bit black and white. So when someone goes through that type of education, maybe they're not that open typically to something new and they disregard the science behind it. Um, however, like, like we talked already, the times are changing, integrative medicine is becoming more popular. It, doctors do seem to be doing a little bit more of their own research and even 
are realizing that they're not getting enough nutritional uh, education, for example, like I've heard several doctors complain about that. So yeah, I'd say mostly maybe they wouldn't be that open, but I think it's also changing than from like how it used to be maybe 10, 20 years ago. I'm, I'm glad that you being the 39 year old is telling the 58 year old that you're seeing a wave of, of newness and acceptance because that's really important. And I'm glad that's up and coming. And, you know, that's why I write my books. You know, this this book, Sedentary Nation, is a biggie. And um, this took me four oh, years. Yeah. Uh, lots of rewrites. It's got a wellness guide mixed in, but I talk about parts of the history of medicine in that book. I talk about the history of physical movement. And I talk about how uh, I learned to live, which mm -hmm. I would call a balanced way. It's not just one way. People ask me what I do for a workout and it's different every day. So today yeah. um, I'll show you my feet. These feet a few hours ago were caked in uh, dirt and dust. And I'm really happy they were caked in dirt and dust because that meant yeah. that I was grounded to the earth and I got the uh, electrical charge of the earth. And I was there for two hours with bare feet. And when we touch dirt with our hands, with our feet, with our body, the sensation that uh, it, it goes to our biochemistry and it, and it does things uh, that I'm sure people have written books on that I couldn't put into words right now, but it it's, it's our heritage, it's our evolution to be touching dirt and to be around dirt and to get the uh, bacteria from dirt and use the healthful bacteria in the proper way and, uh, and be able to, uh, to rid ourselves of the, of the ones that are not helpful for us. So I've, I've said a fair amount. Is there anything in there you want to jump in on? Oh my gosh, I love grounding and I've been doing it more and more. And especially in the summer, like sometimes when I would go work out, I just go work out in the grass with bare feet or I would go like there's these hills that I used to walk and run on. And now I just go there and then I take off my shoes and I leave them behind a rock. I go for a walk or a run and then I come back and pick up my shoes. It's the most calming, energizing, healthy feeling ever. And I think that's one of the keys to treating, like curing a lot of diseases. I actually have a book called grounding therapy, even people with cancer that have had amazing results through grounding. Um, I, I haven't actually read it yet, but I'm going to because I love grounding. And it you you literally are absorbing negative ions from the earth. And the earth is sucking out the positive ions from your body. So positive ions are caused by stress, technology, things like this. Negative ions are produced when someone is relaxed, and they're you find them typically in nature when you're like away from society, technology, stress. Yeah. So grounding is amazing. And I, and I talk about it in my stress management workshops. I talk about it in my weight loss program. I talk about it with all my clients because well, of one, the powerful benefits. One of the things that um, I think is um, a problem in the way we talk about what works and what doesn't work is that people tend to go to the digital written word or a video on YouTube, and they'll find something that is a debunker. Um, what I tell yeah. them, you know, I, I have a problem with that, that word debunked. It's like if there's this whole body of knowledge, and then someone with some notoriety and fame writes something that is criticizing it, someone will post a video saying that was, that has been debunked, like that, that one swath of yeah. the magic wand made all of those, all that body of work which was yeah. pretty balanced, uh, it just eliminated anything by that one author or that one piece of philosophy. So um, I think that what they should do is they should look at things in a holistic way and, and try things. So if yeah. you found cleaning the liver was so healthful, why, why can't we say, and you as a health coach say, well, I want you to try this with a good mind, body, and spirit openness, really give this a yes. try exactly. for two weeks. And, and exactly. see what happens. And if it works, maybe we have something there and let's, let's see what happens. So please, please share what you think about the trial basis and, and what we do with uh, debunking knowledge. Well, as I was talking, the thing that came to my mind was like, try it first. And you, you already said it, try it and then decide, like, sure, do your research on it. But until, unless you just intuitively feels like it, if you intuitively feel like it really doesn't resonate with you, okay, don't. But if you feel like there's any chance that it might help you, 
what do you have to lose, right? So for me too, I, with, with everything, it, for me, it's trial and error. I try it. If it works, I keep doing it. If it doesn't work, I stop. No. <laughs> and it usually doesn't hurt you. Like there's no long-term side effects really typically with natural things. They're quite gentle, even no. if they're powerful. Yeah. So I, I, I tell people with physical uh, that are lacking regular physical activity. A lot of people will all of a sudden Friday or Saturday, Saturday will come around uh, busy work week, uh, school, uh, they're hang, can't, hanging out with their friends, what have you. There's all types of things, uh, chores around the house that prevent people from, I call it getting out and doing some physical movement. I, you know, people call it a workout or exercise, but I call it getting physical movement in a, in a really proactive way that, that what your body needs today, you're doing that. Yes. So it may be very different. You know, like today I did the hard part, a lot of pushing and pulling exercises with a big warm up in the beginning. A lot of neck work. I do neck. The older I get, the more I do neck neck work, usually twice a day. Mm -hmm. And that neck work seems to really help because as we age, you know, there's all kinds of things that push our neck in a, in a way that's not as healthful. And we've been mm -hmm. doing sitting and standing improperly for so many years, it starts to catch up with us. But um, I did that today. And then at the end of that, uh, I felt really good. So I did uphill sprints with bare feet on, on grass. And so I did all that. And then I left and I, I filled up on water. It was so good. Water when you need it is just lovely. Oh so God. I did all that today. And then tomorrow will be different. It's probably going to be a warm up, a stretch and a run. And then, uh, and then some yoga in the evening. So every day is a little bit different. So you can't just say, what do you do, Sifu, for your physical activity? Because it's different every day. And if somebody invites me to go water skiing or play golf, and I say, yes, well, there's a whole new thing that I'm going to go do if, as long as my back and my body is feeling good about it. Tell, tell me what you think about the word physical movement and what you like to coach people on in that respect. Oh my gosh. We're, we're very similar in a lot of our viewpoints. It's very interesting. I didn't expect this, but everything you say, I'm like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's it. I tell people, like, I really teach people how to become in tune with their bodies, how to really feel what they need in that moment, because what matters is what you need in this moment. Um, even if you're craving something that's not good for you, like a, a can of Coke, sometimes maybe that is what your body needs. Like sometimes I've drank Coke when I had an upset stomach and it completely helped it. So tuning into what you need. And for me too, with physical activity, I'm not really good with, um, like having a, a program set out for me because my body feels different every day. And I just don't like structure in general. <laughs> I'm very like free-spirited and that's what feels good to me uh, I, I like general structure but not rigid specific things that I have to follow so for me too with exercise quite often in the morning one day I'll wake up and I feel like I want to dance the type of dance that I do is sometimes I use these fan veils they're kind of like flags these fans and then I also use these big flags so that's one thing I do or sometimes I just feel like dancing without the flags sometimes I feel like going for a run sometimes yoga literally what you just said going swimming going for a hike Maybe I do some chores and at the end of it, I feel really tired and like I did a workout and that's all I do for movement for the day. So that's what I tell my clients. I say, basically, what do you love doing? Pick a few activities you love doing. Like, cause if so some people aren't in tune and they don't know what, where to start. So I just say, think of the things you enjoy doing and then choose one to do that day that feels the most aligned with you. If you hate going to the gym, don't get a gym membership or try do a trial again for two weeks maybe you won't hate it as much as you think because maybe if you buy some nice cute gym clothes and put on some good music and suddenly you like the gym there's certain things you can do to help enjoy exercise better but yeah it's it's my coaching is very individual based with clients like i can work with clients even who are vegan who are on a keto diet who are on a paleo diet and it doesn't matter to me i can work with them with where they're at and then tailor things to their own diets, their own exercise programs. Yeah. So I'm going to reach out and put the vibe out there for you and I to work on getting each other involved in a retreat conference, something like that. So if you see something that comes along, kindly send me the link and I'll apply. And if I see something along, you'll apply and we can go do, do speaker type things and workshop type things. And 
and uh, use that as a professional way to en enhance what we're doing and, and help the, uh, the attendees to the conference. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. So mm -hmm. let's, put, let's keep that in mind so we can go out and roam the planet doing more speaking and wor workshop delivering and connecting with people at, at retreats okay. and conferences. Um, yes. While I was doing my workout here at the Santa Barbara Mission, which is uh, an ancient church uh, founded by the Spanish missionaries, uh, the, the, the local, um, I can't think of it, he, he was a bishop, obispo as a bishop in Spanish. I can't remember if he was, he was a father, Junipero Serra. Juniper Serra is the founder of the Santa Barbara Mission and other missions in California. And I was out there today and it's got a lovely hill to run uphill and it's got these beautiful eucalyptus trees, which are not native to California. They were brought in from Asia, mostly Japan. Uh, but I was watching, I was there early before the dogs were there. I got up at four o'clock California time today. And then I, I got a chance to work on some things and do my foam rolling, which I do yes, every I morning. Do. And I use tennis balls also. So I start out with the tennis balls and I, I do foam rolling after that. And that, that really helps. Boy, talk about preventive and also healing. It does both. And it's also stimulating. So the word stimulation is where I'm going to get to with, with my workout at the mission. I'm standing there in the dirt and little by little, the people who are dog owners who use that field to have their dogs play. And then they have the, the plastic things to throw the tennis balls. They were doing their thing. And I thought to myself, the key wor word here, not just exercise, but it's stimulation. So your mind, body, and spirit get stimulated by coming to this green space you know, the dogs get a drive down there from the owner with the owner and the owner's home, their buddy, even, you know, the owner's the buddy, not just the owner of the dog, it's their buddy. Yeah. And they mm -hmm. get to this park and the dogs, as, as soon as you know, you know, the doors are opening, the dog's really getting excited. They get all the way down here a few miles away, perhaps, and then they get a chance to run. And all the dog owners there, they know that their dogs are friendly, so they can let them off the leash, which in modern days is a big no-no in many places and it's against the rules here, mm. but they're doing it because they've already communicated about the safety of their dog and they understand. And these dogs go out and they do their thing and it's just so lovely. And I thought I would bring up stimulation so I can get that through dance, as you mentioned, through connection with others, through meditation, through mm. physical activity, through a great book, a great video, an inspirational talk, Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech. Boy, you can't beat that for for stimulation and, and motivation. What what should we talk about in terms of how to re reboot people's health as life coaches and to get them a chance to be more stimulated? Well, the word that comes to mind as we're talking about stimulation is simulation, how simulation can never replace stimulation because like being on a treadmill is not the same as going running barefoot on the hills with a beautiful view of the mountains. Like you said, all our senses kind of come alive when we're in a certain environment, when we're connecting with certain people. So I think just, it's quite simple, but kind of going back to the basics, like how things used to be pre-technology. I feel like technology has, I mean, it's great. We're, we get to talk right now because of technology, but it also has made us way more sedentary. It's disconnected us from being around someone and someone's energy when you're around them it really does affect you like that heart connection that you can have in person is so different than when you're talking to someone through a screen or on the phone so i think just like kind of going back to basics and and limiting time on technology i think is a really good way to uh, stimulate your body even when you're eating for example if you're constantly on your phone you're not eating mindfully that's actually quite stressful to the body. So what you should do is actually take a few deep breaths before you have a meal. I don't always do this because I forget, but to like really calm your body, get into that parasympathetic uh, state, which preps your digestive system for better digesting. And then don't be on your phone, just like enjoy the taste of the food, sit there through the motions, eat with someone, like have a conversation, which is what people used to do before cell phones came out or TV came out, right? So just more traditional things. And it's all very simple stuff. Like you said, taking the dog out to a dog park rather than maybe just letting him out in the backyard, right? It's funny you mentioned dogs because I'm going to start dog sitting tonight for a friend. 
for five days and I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I brought out the phone before and I know I, we can take pictures of our dogs and send them to our friends, but just as important is treating that dog like it needs to be treated. It's, a, yeah. it's an animal. We're also animals. We take care of our dogs in many cases, um, not the people who overfeed their dogs, um, but the people who tr treat their dogs properly and give them exercise and, 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 and take them in when they need uh, uh, some treatment, um, not, not just you know, surgery, but take them in for normal treatment, a boil, what have you. And most people, I would say, it's sad to say, I, it, I don't know if you'd say most, but a, a significant number of people treat their pets better than they treat themselves because they're caretaking, but they're not caretaking. They're big on caretaking their kids and their pets, but many people are not big on caretaking themselves. And they, and they think that, you know, they can put the best fuel in their car and get their cars uh, oil changed every 5,000 miles. Yeah. But what about themselves? What about, you know, the mechanics uh, notebook about how to take care of the human body, which I try to do as much as I can in, in this book. And I'm, I've got many more books to come out in that respect. How, how come these people, in your opinion, don't take care of themselves with any sort of regularity and, and listening to common sense? I think because a lot of us are just disconnected from ourselves and we're distracted. There's too much stimulation outside of us um, that we don't, we're not grounded. So we're like, up in our heads, out here versus like in here, in our bodies, in our hearts. Um, and therefore we're not guided by that inner wisdom that's always there, we're, which the inner wisdom will tell you, go take care of yourself. There's just too much going on right now, like information overload. Um, people are like, I don't know, too busy or something, hectic lifestyles. And then they we're just always looking outside of ourselves. That's kind of the common theme. We're looking outside of ourselves rather than within. And so part of caretaking of something else or someone else is looking outside of ourselves. So it's just kind of like bringing it all back here. Like even taking a moment and putting your hand on your heart, it's like it's grounding or going, like you said, standing outside on the grass, it's grounding. So once we start to ground more, we naturally start to take care of ourselves more. I, I think <laughs> I've noticed that with myself. I, um, I make the case in some of my writing that we are a neurotic society. And yeah. it's not just that we worry about things, it's that we are living in our heads. So rather than being a mind, body, and spirit thing, we, we can tend to get more information and do more thinking and worrying in our heads. And so that's the, that's the root of our problem. And that's also the beginning of the solution, because if we take the step and we go quiet the mind and go out there and do what Sifu does, I'm not the first person to do natural physical movement at six in the morning for two hours. Um, I'm, I've learned that from other people and, and it works. And, you know, people say, how come your posture is so good? And how come your brain's working at age 58? I have a lot of contacts who are in their fifties uh, have started having memory issues, stress issues, turning into werewolves at times where the behavior is uh, non-balanced and, and you don't want to talk to these people anymore. I had, I had that happen just the other day. It's very sad, but it, it keeps coming up and I'm trying to do as much as I can to release and to keep the, everything connected in a balanced way mm -hmm. so that I can be similar to what I was last year, which was functional and happy. Why not try to do that this year and in future years and instead of having my posture do something mm -hmm. like this and crush down uh, all of my spinal cord and you know press down on my internal organs, that's not good. You you want to be open and flowy, and and it, and it takes work to do that. It takes maintenance, just like we do with our dogs yeah. and in our in our automobiles. One exercise I love doing in the morning, which is the grounding and connecting, and also for posture, is like the heart opening exercise which is this. <laughs> so you can like, it's kind of like a warrior pose where you lunge with one foot forward and then you just look up and you open and your whole torso and your heart chakra, let's say, just opens up and it just does something, especially because 
like, you know, we're hunched over like this over our computers much of the day. So that first of all opens our posture, but it opens up our like energetic field, our auras rather than keeping them constricted. So I love doing that, yeah. And that's also a, a way for like divinity or spirit to kind of come through, like through you <laughs> in, in every sense of the word, through your body, through your speech. Why don't we talk about the uh, spiritual side? We did talk a little bit about uh, the mind, but we talked a lot about, uh, about the body. Let's talk about the spiritual side and what the ancients did with it, um, how they thought nature was pretty cool, scary at times. You know, nature, if you live in Florida, is scary several months of the year. If you live in uh, places in Oklahoma and Kansas, there, there are things that come through with, with winds whipping up things. And so nature yeah. can be scary, but how do we connect with the ancients and the idea of honoring the spirit world and, and the universe and our connection to those things? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, our minds are very in sync, but I love that you brought up that nature is beautiful, but also scary. Because when I think about, for example, animals in the wild eating each other, yeah. uh, and or like I watch these shows, Animal Planet, where I'm feeling bad for the predator because he can't find his prey sometimes. He goes hungry for days. And then I feel bad for the prey once he catches the prey because then he gets eat, the prey gets eaten alive. And I'm like, oh, these poor animals. It's not such an easy life. Like it looks so wonderful. But really, they're spending most of their time just like looking for food or running away from predators, <laughs> which is scary. <laughs> so yeah, nature is... is it sounds vicious to, uh, to us, uh, people who grew up in a, maybe a safe society. It's, nature sounds somewhat vicious. Yeah, but I guess it's just our perception of it, right? So it, it just is what it is. And it's the ebbs and flows and in our life too. Good things happen, bad things happen. We judge them for what they are. I mean, we judge them for what we, th we think that they are, but really it just is. Like, we don't, we don't know. There's so much we don't know. Like our souls, our spirits are in charge. The spirit knows, the soul knows, but our intellectual mind can't comprehend and plus like life is so short on earth in the span of eternity maybe these terrible things we go through are the best things for us who knows for the evolution of our soul right but anyway um what did you ask me how do we connect to the to the, the to nature to the spiritual realm to the to the universe how, how do these fit in with our our meanderings through life in a in a busy concentrated focus and sometimes fearful way yeah well one thing i wanted to say is i heard a really cool quote that said let me get this right uh the soul is not inside the body the body is inside the soul so first of all seeing ourselves not that we have like the soul living somewhere i don't know in our hearts or somewhere it's like our bodies are inside our soul like our soul is all around everywhere and our bodies like entered it <laughs> um so seeing ourselves from that perspective that we are like one spiritual being having a human experience there's another quote for you um so i think recognition of that that we are spiritual beings um And to me, it goes back to grounding. It's all about grounding. Like you connect with the earth, you're connecting with ancestors, you're connecting with something greater than yourself. Um, going out, looking up at the stars, like especially when you're outside of the city and you just like look up and you're like, whoa, there is so much out there beyond me. Cause we can get so focused on what's in front of us and, and our own little tiny lives that we forget the vastness of the universe and of this human experience. Um, so to me, yeah, like looking, looking at things from a different perspective. And sometimes when I'm worrying about something and I'm so caught up in my head, I'll observe myself zooming out, like going out into space and then looking at myself from space and then seeing how minute I am and how minute my problems are. Um, like literally I'm a speck in the universe. And then I'm like, why do, why did these problems seem humongous to me right now? But they're not. And then I think of all the other people on earth and I think of all the other planets in the universe. And I just feel like, wow, that, that makes me feel connected, I guess. Yeah. Important stuff. Uh, you know, so if you do walk around bare feet, 
and you start to feel at one with the surroundings of, of the park, the hillside, the beach, wherever you can do that grounding, um, you, you start to think differently. So you mentioned grounding. So I think that's really important to do that. Spend time outdoors. Like uh, I mentioned that it's diurnal living. So two parts of the day, you're out at the mor in the morning and you're in in the evening. Uh, so when the sun, sun sets, you're, you're starting to wind things down. So that's really what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to wake up and hang out inside of a building all day. We really want to be in sunlight. And if it's cloudy, we want to be in light outdoors. Yeah. And we want to see the clouds moving. We want to see people moving. We want to see the plants and the animals as much as possible and be, be around others sometime and get, and get that stimulation from others. So these are all natural things. And I, I guess they would lead us to that connection with the outdoors, with, with nature. And if we're moved by all that, there the, is the spirit moving through us and we can just keep connecting with it and feeling more and more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And like, this makes me think also about the wisdom of trees. There are books written about the, like what happens in the root system of the trees, how they communicate with each other. Like there is so much wisdom in nature or even any kind of, like I said, animal show that you watch where these birds migrate, they know where to go. Um, or where, for example, like I was watching one where there was all these penguins and then the, mo the mother goes and finds food for the babies and then they come back and they find a penguin in a swarm of 500,000 other penguins just by the call, the sound of the call. Like, and they're all calling at each other and somehow they can hear the babies. Just like there's so much intuitive wisdom in the natural. Um, and I just think our minds override that so much. And our minds are great for like logical thinking, for building structures, for doing math. Like that's really helpful. But there's just so much more that we haven't tapped into yet. And I just think of nature, how they can do all that without a brain, like the kind of brain that we have. So what could we do when we tap into that? And I noticed that when I tap into that part of me, so many cool things happen. First of all, I say things that I never knew I had in me to say, or I come across people that I, I'm like, wow, how did I bump into you? Or just like really cool situations happen because I feel like I'm, I'm connected to something greater than me, something that knows better than me and that can guide me to where I need to be. Somebody uh, a long time ago, uh, maybe almost 30 years ago, when I was doing a lot of work and I was hanging out in my office in Sacramento frequently. Uh, I played tennis and sports in the evening, cardio, funk, aerobics, golf, water skiing, et cetera. But he told me that I need to circulate. And that was for my business. So I was networking and meeting people. And that doesn't mean you're going to find business uh, contacts each and every day, but get out there and meet people, have your appointments, go out to have breakfast or lunch with people. You got to circulate. And I think that's important just in the normal walk of life. If we're going to the supermarket and the coffee shop and then going back to our, our the confines of our, our apartment or home, it's, it's not, in my opinion, the right amount of circulating. And, and if you're a philosopher, as I am, and a writer, I want to test the things that I'm learning. I want to go out and talk to people with opposing points of view, with more knowledge in certain subjects than I have and have conversations. It could be two minutes. It could be an hour and a half. Yeah. Get out and, and test that knowledge and, and learn from other people, interact, stimulate other people, work with kids, those types of things. How, how important do you think it is for us to physically circulate in our communities? Well, that's a really cool concept that I've never heard of. And that's a cool word uh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I just think about myself and I think how inspired I feel after I meet someone new or after like I just click with someone or I learn something that I had no idea about. It's just it's just like such a um, light feeling, I suppose. But yeah, I think it's it's very important, but it's not something I really thought about until you mentioned it. So like you said, just going to the grocery store and coming back home, that's kind of like stagnant. It's a it's minimal not, circulation. <laughs> yeah, stagnation and like kind of deadening almost like, yeah. in a, you know, but whereas, so even with like changing of environment, I think that's really important for us too, to stimulate our senses, even if it means like for me driving out to the mountains once in a while, which is 
like an hour away from here, just to change things up. Um, and I think that probably affects our creative brain in some way, helps us to see differently and think differently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a really cool point. I, I want to start incorporating that into my practice, I, telling I people have, to circulate um, more. Circulate, yeah. yeah. I have an alternative to us talking about alternative cures and healthy good stuff and wonderful things like colloidal silver. Yes, I have that exact one at home. You have the exact one. I, what if we do a follow-up where we talk about interactive wellness treatments, where we talk about inflammation, uh, food allergies, um, the, um, uh, the autoimmune symptoms and diseases and treatments. Why don't we do another follow-up in a, two weeks maybe where we can talk about some and hold up different uh, curatives. Yeah. Sure. Um, I've got, you know, my, I've got comma, chamomile tea here. Yeah. <laughs> my colloidal silver, got my foam roller. Yeah. I've got a kombucha and sesame seeds. So it's just uh, omega threes. It's just like, I'm, this is just touching the surface on the things I have in my area, but we could go through a lot of these things and talk about what you know, and I'll share a little bits and pieces about what I know. And and we could have kind of an interactive, what's in your cupboard if you're a wellness practitioner? What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And I think that was going to be the topic of this, but then we went on a tangent, <laughs> which is totally great. Yeah, I'd love to. I actually came prepared with something I wanted to talk about, but I'll talk about it next time. Alternatives. Yeah, why don't we do that? You you pick a top a title for our next talk, and then we'll we'll gear what we're going to show people and how we're going to structure that. And uh, we'll do a more detailed one. That'll be more of a how to repair and rejuvenate yourself with natural uh, medicine. There you go. I think that's great. So something like that, like what's in your cupboard and then also maybe alternatives to junk food because <laughs> what's in your refrigerator and, and uh, in your, in your food cupboard. Yeah, and for example, so I'll talk about this more next time, but for example, these are almonds, dark chocolate almonds, and then not healthy milk chocolate almonds. And I just want to talk about the difference next time I'll talk about it, but you can so easily replace things because I'm not about eliminating things. I don't like feeling restricted or deprived. So I like to replace things. And so there's so many, with almost any junk food, you can replace it with something healthier for you. And that's actually not only healthier, but tastes better and has the mineral and vitamin content for, that your body needs. Because often when you're craving something, it's because you're mineral deficient or vitamin deficient in it. But when you're eating junk food, you're eating empty calories and that's why you get addicted because you keep eating, but nothing's happening uh, beneficial in your body. So yeah, I think that's a good topic. I'd love to talk about that. So uh, again, I'm Sifu Slim at sifuslim.com, author of books, fitness, wellness, and life coach, and uh, got some, uh, Art articles being uh, published by a sports psychology uh, uh, publication being run by the University of Vienna, Sigmund Freud. And I'm with a bunch of PhDs. Most of these people are younger than I am by 10 to, to 25 years. And But I've been a writer and I've been at this game my whole life, the wellness and, and fitness and getting more and more spiritual as, as I go and open-minded. You know, that's one of the other things. You got to keep getting more open-minded. You have all this knowledge coming in but you got to keep open so it, things can pass through you but anyway i'm ecstatic to being start to be recognized by people in the university in the scientific research community so hallelujah for that and uh share with us where you're going and what your website is and uh what what you think about the world today uh yeah so again my website is magdalenawellness.com and you can follow me on Instagram because that's where I post a lot of videos and I share a lot of these kind of chocolate almond type things. Uh, that's mambo underscore Megs is my handle. Uh, but the things I'm working on right now is uh, my Love Your Body program, which is a 12 week weight loss program, which does not focus on weight loss, just on healthy living. Uh, and that's starting up in October, actually. And then I'm also running my stress management workshops. They're called Empower Hour because I empower you within one hour. And that's for corporations and organizations. And it's a 
I offer four different workshops within that series and companies can choose from one or all four. Uh, and then I'm always open to one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have a few clients that I'm working with right now. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm, and, uh, and more podcasts and interviews. I'm always open to doing those. Yep. I actually have something that I run on Instagram called I interview interesting people on IG. <laughs> So you should be a guest one time. I would love, I would love to. Um, yeah. How about the question about where the world is going? So where the world is going, can you specifically specify that I, a bit more? I wish I could, but I'll, I'll try my, I'll try my best to re reboot something in my brain. So um, where is the world going on June 23rd and 24th, in your opinion, uh, now that we're in the some form of the stage of the pandemic that's been going for over a year and a half. I wish I knew, but it seems like from my experience talking to people, it's like some people are going this way and some people are going this way. <laughs> some people are going more towards listening to what the government is saying and just following rules and then other people are just connecting more to themselves and kind of doing their own thing and i'm just kind of in the middle yeah. it's hard for me to have an opinion because i don't know what's going on it's also confusing but i for me personally where i'm going is just connecting more to myself focusing on what's good um doing my best to use less technology <laughs> to connect more with people that are in front of me to be more in the present moment because we can't really predict what's going to happen. So that's that's where I'm headed. It's just more nature time, more more me time. <laughs> very very uh, well handled. That was a tough question, and I wanted to because you you seem to handle every other question with a, a deep ease. And so I wanted to throw one that was a little tougher in there. And you did very well with it. So thank you. Um, I have a way to end our little interaction today. And it's a Cherokee prayer blessing, Cherokee Native American tribe. And, cool. uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll end the recording after that, but please stay on for a minute afterwards so we can uh, say our uh, goodbyes properly. Sure. And uh, here's how the Cherokee prayer blessing goes. May the warm winds of heaven blow softly upon your house. May the great spirit bless all who enter there. May your moccasins make happy tracks in many snows, and may the rainbow always touch your shoulder. So if you wouldn't mind touching your shoulder right now, and then we'll wind that down. Oh, cool. I love that. That's so cool. Prayers always make me cry. <laughs> so we wish everyone out there um, all the best in their health, happiness, and wellness. Please connect with us if, if you feel moved to do so. And please like and please subscribe. Aloha. Bonjour. Bonjour.